stemmed from work in chaos theory and mixing with a combination of scientific insight and visualization. His research work has been featured on the covers of Nature, Science, Scientific American, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA, and other publications. Supervised 60 plus PhD students, written over 250 papers, two books, given invited presentations at over 200 universities across the world. He's an academic entrepreneur and was founding co-director of the Northwestern Institute of Complex Systems and Education Research Initiatives in Design, Entrepreneurship, Energy, and Sustainability. In 2008, he was selected by the American Institute of Chemical Engineers as one of the 100 engineers of the modern era. In 2017, Otina was awarded the Bernard M. Gordon, Gordon Prize prize for innovation in engineering and technology education from the National Academy of Engineering for the concept of whole brain engineering. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has been a Guggenheim Fellow and is a member of both the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, I think you're going to like what Julio has to say. And so I will now turn this over to him. And uh, the title of his talk, Art, Technology, and Science, Intersections, Bifurcations, and Opportunities. Julio? Hey, thank you, Steve. I think I need, I need to update the, the brief that we sent. So it's three books now. So <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted to be here, be able to talk to all of you. This is going to be a sampling of uh, this book. Um, the book is basically about two things, is augmentation of thinking and complexity, really. And I'm going to go through a selection of things contained in the book, but I'm going to start with uh, when art and science were one, this will be very, very sketchy, how they separated and how may join again um, and why, okay? So the book uh, features lots of historical references and one of them is about uh, 600 years ago, the citizens of Florence who had built a cathedral without completely in a, in the dome, uh, held a competition to see who could build a dome. They know it could be done because the Pantheon um, on the left in there in Rome uh, was still, I see, probably one of the oldest buildings surviving from antiquity in almost its initial conception, but they had no idea how to, to do this. So they had the competition and two people, Lorenzo Ghiberti and Filippo Brunelleschi competed for this. And I have the story about this and Filippo Brunelleschi because this was several, several years before Leonardo da Vinci, but as opposed to da Vinci who left lots of plans, but never built anything, Brunelleschi built something which still stands, but left no plans. All the plans were gone. Okay, so this is uh, someone who personified the intersection of art, technology, and science. He even had to invent machines to build the El Duomo, uh, invented the loss of perspective, also wrote plays. So he was the prototypical Renaissance man. And almost anybody who has been in this space at some point mentions this uh, lecture by C.P. Snow, the two cultures. But this, uh, I, of course I mentioned this, but it's, um, it's mostly about writing and it's mostly about science. There is no technology, it's, it's worth reading, but it's a lecture that has received disproportionate uh, attention uh, as opposed to other things that were going on in the same space. But it was about how scientists have an image of people in writing that was wrong and vice versa, and how were the, 
they were poorly educated on each side. And of course, Hippies now was well-versed on both sides. Now, for a long, long while, when Filippo Brunelleschi was operating art, science, technology, the word technology didn't exist. Even the word science didn't exist. But uh, the concept of progress didn't exist. Uh, everything sort of had invented by the ancients. And uh, the looking back and believing that everything that could have been invented was had been invented was the prevailing mode. Uh, Galileo, for example, had to teach a, a sort of Ptolemaic um, ideas because that was philosophy was at the top of the business, or the top of the scale in knowledge. But at some point, things started to bifurcate. By the time that you reach Niccolo Tartaglia and studies on, for example, the trajectory of, of uh, cannonballs, uh, people started investing in supporting people like Tartaglia because they were a whole bunch of city states. And they saw that math and the knowledge that it will bring making fortifications, ballistic trajectories, it started tilting the balance away from the philosophers to these new scientists, even though the word science did not exist at the time. And by the time that Galileo came into the picture, we're going to see him again, and is credited with the birth of the scientific method. Um, the things started shifting. And there are now many examples I will cover, um, although I will pick one on two in here, of examples of art influencing sciences and sciences influence art. Uh, one is the Galileo Harriot. Pasteur and Chirality is a very nice example. And I will mention a couple of these very, very much in passing. But and there was a time in which, for example, ideas emanating from hyperdimensional spaces. Poincaré was a first-rate mathematician, but also had the ability to write well. And some of his writings were interpreted by people who uh, were in contact with the group that Picasso was running. And uh, those ideas, hyperdimensional spaces, the, the fellow who popularized some of these things was um, this guy, John Metzinger and Glazes, who wrote the book about the theory of cubism. And these ideas started reaching Picasso and, and his speculation that some of those ideas could have been influenced cubism, but they were there. It, there is a doc documentation that these exchanges took place. Also, the, even though there is no record whatsoever that Niels Bohr, who, Niels Bohr was, in many respects, the equivalent of Albert Einstein in the intellectual scale of uh, that emerged with new physics. Uh, we know that uh, Niels Bohr, what you have in there is um, the, the sitting room in Niels Bohr's house. Niels Bohr's house uh, was given to Niels Bohr by the, the Danish government. And of all the paintings that he could pick to put in his, in his house, he picked this um, painting by Jan Menzinger. And the story is that uh, one of the claims to fame of Niels Bohr is complementary, in which something could be two things at once, light, particle, wave. He, the, there are records of, from his son, who had a friend who was a painter, about Bohr explaining complementarity using this, uh, painting as a prompt, okay? But this is all very sketchy. Something in a little bit more detail is this idea that in the 1600s, for the first time in history, two people use an optical tube to look at the moon. What is an optical tube? An optical tube is what now you call a telescope, except that no one had any interest in looking at the skies because the skies were supposed to be permanent. Even the moon was supposed to be perfect. And why? Because the Greeks had said so. So these optical tubes were marketed to armies to see advancing ships. Um, but 
Galileo, who was in Padua, uh, Padua and Florence, uh, and Harriet was in London, got the idea of looking at the moon. They pointed the telescope at the moon. Galileo later on observed Jupiter, even so that they had moons itself. And before that, the moon was supposed to be a perfect sphere. You can look it with your naked eyes and you see there are spots. There are all sorts of explanations for what uh, it was called the strange spottedness of the moon. Uh, maybe it was the moon was reflecting the earth. Maybe it was something made of something that resembled alabaster. And when they look at the moon, uh, Galileo drew his observations. They were looking at the exactly the same image with, with almost identical optical tubes. Harriot did these uh, ink drawings, drew what he saw. And Galileo did these watercolor sketches. Well, it, Galileo was an accomplished artist to the point that he was admitted as a member of La, La Academia dell'Arte del Diseño in Florence, uh, created by Giorgio Vasari. But uh, the sketching here was based on um, the drawings that uh, the sketches that Galileo had made, the watercolors. But the difference between the two was that Galileo was in the middle of Florence and in Florence, the Academia di Arte del Diseño as a kind of indoctrination into everything that was artistic. Every sculptor, painter, architect had to go through things and exercise in perspective. By the way, some of these drawings were um, and sketches were exhibited some time ago at the block. And so Galileo knew perspective, Harriot did not. So when Galileo observed the changes of shapes and shadows, he could even estimate the height of the craters of the moon. And this is a wonderful example of the intersection of art, which Galileo had, technology, the optical tube, science, the calculations of the height, but also the influence of placement. Uh, Florence, all of these ideas coexisted. And at that point, Harriet was in London and London at some point, at that point was not a place with this wonderful intersection of the art, science and technology. So this is something that we cover in this book. And the origin of the book is, I have had the idea of doing this book forever, for the last 15 years at least, and the book was actually finished because of the pandemic. And at some point during the pandemic, I had completed a manuscript and I called a friend who I had been discussing these ideas for the last 15 years. In fact, when we give talks, we say that the book is a result of 12 years of talks, uh, so 12 years of coffees and about two years of Zoom talks. And that friend is Bruce Mao. Bruce Mao, I, I met him or I wanted to meet him after I saw a show that he did at the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Chicago. This was one of the rooms in the show. And this is another room. So Bruce Mao is probably one of the, he's probably the most famous designer alive now. Uh, There's even a movie that you can rent in Apple Plus about his life, it just appeared. Uh, the premiere of the movie took place at the MoMA in New York, and then he got the full page in the New York Times. And so Bruce and I have a conference of interest. Yeah, I had uh, part of my interest in visual arts permeated into my work. So a lot of what I have been able to do in nonlinear dynamics and chaos, I think I was helped a lot by having this visual sort of component to my thinking. And so Bruce and I decided that we wanted to do something. And why we wanted to do something is because uh, the problem has lot, the world has lots of problems. Uh, there are bigger problems, bigger teams, the boundaries are blurring, knowledge is fragmented, there are lots and lots of issues. Uh, 
connectivity, where those innovations are becoming shorter, uh, the environment is changing, lots and lots of problems that we can list. And in fact, out of this list, you can isolate, for example, the ones that have to do with connectivity. And out of the, this, at some point, this became the manifesto of the book. And out of this manifesto, there were two things that became crucial for us. One is augmenting new ways of thinking. And since that way of thinking has to live in the world that we live in, it has to master the complexity of the world. And so these are the, the, the book breaks ground in many levels, but the people at MIT were wonderful on this because they were in awe of Bruce helping with the design, but it's basically the new convergence of art, technology, and science, augmenting the thinking, uh, and the augmented thinking for a complex world. So the book will cover lots of things, and I'm going just to mention a few things that are covered in the book, leadership, innovation, the kind of size is how important they are, technology, history, uh, creative organizations, some things that may be news to some of you, they are chasing possible, epiphanies, creative longevity, intersections, universities, a whole bunch of things, even chaos theory, artificial intelligence, some math, uh, because it's about prediction and even education. Now, we're not the first people who have the idea of operating this intersection between art, technology, and science. This was an early idea by Harry Holtzman. Harry Holtzman was probably better known now because he's the guy who arranged for Mondrian to come to the US. But Harry Holtzman was the editor with, uh, uh, of this journal called Transformation. Uh, this is the entire run of the journal, 50, 51, 52. But this is what the journal was about. At first, that art, technology, and science are interacting components of a total human enterprise. But today, they are too often treated as the, the word cultural isolates and mutual antagonistic. Transformation will cut across the arts and science by treating them as a continuum. And they commission articles. Not all of these were in one issue, but this is a wonderful collection of people from John Cage, Pierre Boulez, De Kooning, Heisenberg, Giacometti. So I just, this receives a lot of play in our book. But the book is about modes of thinking. Why the modes of thinking associated with art? And I'm talking about modern and contemporary art. Technology and science are different. So let me start with this. In technology, you have these sigmoidal curves with the birth of the technology, rapid growth and maturation. And if I show you any technology, and I'm representing here by pictures, you more or less can tell me that if you start asking questions, you come from outer space, that a computer came after a fountain pen. So there is an arrow of time to technology. Uh, this is a ways of recording and storing information. And sometimes in technology, you see quantum changes. Uh, this happened to be at the Museum of Harley Davidson in Milwaukee. And you have here the 1912 bike, one cylinder, leather belt, 1913, two cylinder chain belt. And this is the way that Harley Davidson stayed for a hundred years. But in technology, no matter how good you are at something, all the knowledge that you have associated with creating wonderful combustion engines becomes completely obsolete when Harley Davidson changes to e bikes. So what I'm trying to give in here in some sense is the thinking modes. And I'm going to use visual art as a sort of backdrop. Why? Because contrary to what most people imagine about visual art, 
you can see the creative process in action, the trail survives. So for example, these are sketches of Guernica, Picasso. We know that there are 43 sketches documented by his mistress at the time, Francois Guillot, and eventually this became Guernica. And if I show you uh, paintings, an eclectic list between 1910, 1988, and there's not much technology here, uh, unless you really are into checking pigments and that kind of thing, and I ask you, can you put them in chronological order? Unless you are an art historian, you will not be able to do that. The oldest one, by the way, is Kandinsky here. The newest one is Basquiat here. But these two by Gera Richter happened to be done by the same person and you couldn't imagine two things farther apart. There's more technology in making chairs. Every architect and designer has at some point designed a chair. But even if I ask you, put this in the right chronological order, it will be tough. So the sigmoidal curve captures the evolution of a technology and a technology followed by another technology. Um, and eventually they could join more smoothly like that. And then you have these curves in which these lines, jagged lines represent revolutions. And those are in my view, how technology and science evolve. And modern art is more like this. And I like to quote Peter Scale that he just died. He was my favorite section in the New Yorker. He said, the, post, the modern, postmodern, and post-postmodern may have been the last recognizable periods. Then this moves disintegrated to, and it has been pretty much one dumb thing after another one ever seen. So we have these three things in here. In science, science has been open source since, has not always been like that, and the history is very, very complicated, but with the advent of journals, you build your arguments on the shoulders of your predecessors. So standing on the shoulders of giants is a good strategy in science. In technology, the only reason to stand on the shoulders of an elder giant is to crush the elder giant. You want your technology to displace the previous one. And in art, it's probably a bad idea to stand close to anybody. What you want is uniqueness and something that becomes your DNA and derivative is a really good thing in technology. All technologies are amalgams of previous technology. Derivative is not a word that an artist will appreciate representing their work. So you have these extreme thinking modes. Uh, this is obviously a metaphor. Uh, the, the, on the left, the rational uh, left brain, logic, analytical, convergent, uh, and on the right, thinking more in uh, terms of metaphors, divergent images, and so on and so forth. And what the nexus thinking is, the nexus is seeing this all at once. Different ways of seeing the world, but seeing the whole rather than the parts. Now, one thing that happens when you have this kind of thinking is that you will have to deal with conflicting views. Uh, looking at the problem, you, you may have two different versions of how that thing looks like. But the key thing is to understand how others think. So um, looking at an object without knowing how that came into being is having an incomplete sort of view of things. I, I pick this. This is one from one of our colleagues, Mike Rakovitz. He's a professor in art theory and practice. And he got this commission of the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square. This is highly, highly sought thing in art. And I'm not going to give you all the details of this, but it happens that when he was given the possibility of putting this in this plinth, he realized that the dimensions were similar to the, a wind bull that had been destroyed by ISIS methodically with the Jack Hammer in here, and he wanted to recreate this in, in that thing there, but he didn't want to put something like 3D printed or anything. The whole wing bull in Trafalgar Square is made with 
cans of, of um, date syrup because that represents to Rakovic uh, what people from Iraq, he was born in the US, his uh, ancestry is Jewish, but this is what represents the most uh, longing for the country for Iraqis who are outside Iraq. So the whole, the whole wind ball in Trafalgar Square is made with this. And this idea of recycling also plays with other parts in Trafalgar Square, especially the, the, the column about Nelson itself, because it's made with recycling canals. So knowing the origins is important. The question was how to present this in a book. So the book, uh, in here you see sort of like an opening sequence, like opening credits in a movie, before the book uh, starts with a conventional ISBN uh, page, like in page 14. And then you have the books starting with an image. And then this, uh, on this is, there are many examples of text next to the other text. There are uh, side notes of different kinds. Uh, building this is not trivial because the amount of real estate for the side notes is basically one fourth of a page, as opposed to a footnote in which you can lift things up and down. And then all chapters start obviously with the title, and then things that you wouldn't know unless I tell you. So every uh, chapter, this is one of them, it starts with a phrase followed by a sentence. So this is a chapter three, chapter four, chapter five. Uh, there was a lot of conversations about curating the set of images that um, it will go into the book. Uh, this is reflecting, this is a chapter on complex systems. This is a wonderful example of something by uh, Mariko Mori, a Japanese artist. Um, uh, people are supposed to walk into this, have electrodes that will read kind of brain waves. And then the book closes with a series of images is like the closing credits. And a chapter of the book, which was probably the, the first thing that Bruce and I discussed was a comparing structures of the domain. So we have art, technology, and science, and you can pick almost any issue, uh, how ideas get evaluated by, we also make a distinction between domain and field, and how do they compare? And the reason that art, technology, and science are ordered in this way, because by almost every measure, technology is always sandwiched in between uh, art and science. And we have lessons that cross domains. There is a whole chapter on lessons. So there are lessons that you can derive from art that could go into technology or science. Um, so one lesson that we show is this series of uh, uh, lithographs by uh, uh, Picasso. And we always make the point that unless you knew it in advance or uh, you have been looking at the day, the way that Picasso actually did this is, this is the first, and I'm not going to show all of them. There are 11 total, and this is the last. And the concept in here, is out of complexity, isolating simplicity, and out of simplicity, seeing complexity. And the ability of seeing simplicity in complexity and complexity in simplicity is essential. I would say theory, theoretical work, is always about seeing the simplicity in the complexity. But if you want an example of simplicity going into complexity, uh, the last sentence of the Watts paper by Watson and Crick on the structure of DNA, the one that won the Nobel Prize 
900 word paper, uh, says something like, it has not escaped our attention that the structures so proposed can have interesting biological consequences. Well, all biotechnology emerges from that ability of DNA to copy itself. So this is an important lesson and the ability of seeing simplicity in complexity and complexity in simplicity and seeing both at the same time is essential. A couple of more lessons from art, since especially uh, from the science side, sometimes we have preconceptions. These are a few sketches of uh, something that became La Dance, is a painting by uh, Matisse. The, this one happens to be at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. There is another version of this at the MoMA. But not every time that Matisse, who had a long creative life, painted into his 90s, went to his studio, he had an idea about what to do. So sometimes he painted what he had lying around the studio. And in here, he happened to do a painting with La Dance in the background, and this is another one. So the point of this, the lesson in here is, most people don't understand the amount of work preparation and structure that requires to operate in art. But the lesson is inspiration is overrated. If you want something good to happen to you, you have to constantly be at it. This is also another Picasso happens to be at the MoMA. Uh, it's, it's a bronze, but the cast was made with all found objects. So for example, the ears of the, it's called Baboon and Young. They were handles from jars. The, the head is two cars, toy cars, pots and pans. So the lesson in here is adopt and adapt. And once you see the hole in something really well composed, the individual pieces disappear. And uh, this you see in technology all, all, all the time. But there are more lessons about cross domains. And let me just go one from the other side and it's explaining complexity. And in order to explain complexity, you have to define what you mean by complicated and complex, okay? So let me kind of make a brief detour in here. By the 1960s, uh, math has become so, so effective that Eugene Wigner, Nobel Prize, he was in Princeton. Um, he wrote this paper about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. And the idea was that with building blocks, you could build things upwards. Uh, this was the essence of reductionism. You have the building blocks, the idea even rich economics with a rational man concept. Uh, now it has been abandoned, but the idea is that if you recognize the building block, you can build understanding upwards. And then in the same place, Princeton, this fellow Philip Anderson, who is the one who invented also Nobel Prize physics, um, <clears throat> came up with the idea that actually, no, if you have more things, sometimes you get behavior that is outside what you would have seen from the building blocks. So the idea is that this is the beginning of complexity. There are systems in which they have been designed in which all the pieces fulfill a role a clock, a nuclear sub, a jet, an integrated circuit. But then there are systems in which the, you can know the individual pieces, but you're going to study a fish to death and never imagine that fish will organize in schools like this. Or you've got to study a neuron to death and never imagine that consciousness will appear when they organize in something like is in this case, the human brain. So systems that are complicated, they have blueprints, Every part fulfills function. The function of those pieces doesn't change. There is even a user manual for repairs. You can predict failures. In systems that are complex, they fail more gracefully. They are adaptable and um, contextual. Sometimes uh, a good example with stem cells that can take on many functions. And they display something that from this, you can produce this, and this is called emergence. And this is the fingerprint of complexity. And 
there are lots of lessons that have emerged from the studies of complex systems over the last 20 years. Uh, that simple behaviors can produce complex outcomes, but also that this idea of complementarity is built within complex systems. Chaos and order can coexist. Depends on the length of the, the scale of observation. And also that organization can emerge without central control. So the idea of complementarity came from quantum mechanics, as I mentioned, Niels Bohr trying to explain what light was. Light is what it is depending on how you observe it. It's a wave when it travels, it's a particle interacts with matter. But the idea that opposites can coexist, chaos and order, emergence and blueprint, reductionism and complexity, and this is important. Now, one, one idea that emerges out of this, and I mentioned when I, when I talk about Wigner, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics was that understanding implies prediction. Okay? That's how all physics was. Uh, and science, in general, until recently, if you understand, you may be able to predict, and the ability to predict depends on understanding. But the truth now is that understanding does not imply prediction, that's a given. But now with AI, you can predict things without really understanding them. And even though this may sound really weird, the AI that was pursued in the 70s, in which people tried to understand the algebra of thought, how a mind works, it is completely different is what I call a break with, with what we are doing now with machine learning, which is essentially is brute force. You can predict something without really understanding, it's just looking at all past experience. But the truth is, people were doing things without knowing the basis of why they work. People were building stained glass windows in medieval times without knowing any of the chemistry of glass or how glass could actually be manufactured or what colors were doing if you have cobalt or iron or whatever in the glass. And you can go back and in, on the left, you have the aqueduct of in Segovia. By the way, there is a little plaque about the National Academy of Engineering somewhere in here in, on the left. The Romans were building aqueducts without really knowing much about hydrodynamics. The slope of some of these aqueducts was one in 4,000. They, they, they did not know about fluid mechanics. They did not know about uh, structures, uh, solid mechanics but they work. So the point in here of the book is have this more global view on how other people think, uh, understanding what motivates uh, artists, for example, uh, what motivates science. Uh, science is not cold and dispassionate as people from one side may think, but the whole point of this is the goal of the book is we go through life looking at things with one pair of glasses. That's the whole purpose of education is giving people a pair of glasses, producing a mental library that gives you a way to see the world, often very successfully, but the possibility of adding another pair if you keep enriching and learning is what humanity should be about. So this is kind of a, a brief, hopefully not very chaotic journey through some of the concepts in the book. 
and I will be more than delighted to answer questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julio. Fabulous. Do uh, I need to stop sharing or or um, or what, what's preferred here? You I like what you, you got. Whichever, whichever you choose. Okay. Uh, this is fine. You know. Yeah. And by the way, the, the an idea on how the book covers many components. Uh, we have to pick five people to put in the back of the book. And this list is like a mutually orthogonal set of people. Uh -huh. Daniel Pink to uh, Win Shotwell, who is the chief operating officer and alum, SpaceX. Orbinski was the president of Doctors Without Border when they got the Nobel Prize. Paola Antonelli is like the top person at the MoMA. And then Bob Langer, if there are people in science at the lecture, they will know among his minor things is Moderna is his company. He has created about 100 different companies. Okay, so I'm ready for questions. So what well, questions will come into the chat. Um, you mentioned three terms that I think would be good for you to elaborate on a little bit. And there it's three C's, chaos, complexity, and um, uh, uh, complicated. That's right, yeah. complicated. Yeah. So differentiate those three because I think it's very instructive. Well, a complicated system is a system in which you design every piece of something that gets assembled in which every piece fulfills a function. And when you put the last little piece, the system functions as intended. As opposed to a complex system in which the interactions between the pieces can produce behaviors, emergence, that was not part of the initial design. It's as if you put the last little gear in a clock and the clock has suddenly spring legs out and it starts walking, okay? Uh, so a complicated system is a system which you design all the pieces and the pieces stay with one clear function. And if you don't want to risk the system going down and failing, you better back up the pieces. For example, in a nuclear sub, uh, you may have backup pieces just in case that someone fails, you put the other one back. But the pieces will not morph into something else that was not in the design. In a complicated system, the system will adapt and within bounds to perturbations and ecology is a complex system, for example. And sometimes they will produce consequences that may surprise you because the linkage in between all the parts is too much for someone to kind of document. For example, the internet, we design all the pieces in the internet, but no one really designed the whole. The whole thing emerged as a, almost a haphazard a, linkages of pieces. Chaos is, is what happens when systems uh, can produce different outcomes depending on slightly different initial conditions. The systems don't need to be very complicated to do this. So a pendulum, for example, is the prototypical system in classical mechanics. But if you have a pendulum with another pendulum hanging from the end of the pendulum, that's already a chaotic system. You start to, I used to travel this, we're giving talks with a double pendulum and it's slightly different initial conditions will produce completely different results. But you can have chaos, but the system as a whole, sometimes it's called a trench attractor, the whole, 
the strange attractor is very, very predictable. Uh, for example, an example could be, let's say that you are modeling evacuations from a big stadium from people and you have exit doors and people have done this. You can model what would happen if, for example, it's an emergency, a bomb is scared and people have to leave. And obviously you want them to live in an orderly way and don't pack up in there. It may be hard to predict what an individual will do exactly, but the behavior of the crowd is predictable. So you cannot predict the details, but you can predict the whole. Julio, I'm looking uh, for some more things in the chat. Uh -huh. Online, I don't see them, but I, I have a, another area that you talk about uh, extensively is this metaphor of right brain, left brain. And I was just thinking as I listened to you this morning that um, but both people who have the attributes of a right brain and people who have the attributes of a left brain can be creative. Um, I have so what what is it you know that that allows people with such different approaches to thinking still to be very creative and i was wondering if it wasn't the ability to handle complexity so the the, the point is i don't know if there is anybody in in the audience on math okay but to me math is one of the most creative things in humanity Okay, but mathematicians will split half and half in between the concept of math being invented or discovered. Uh, many people will have the Platonist view that things are there and we kind of suddenly see them gleaming somewhere and we encase them from, I don't know, from the rock that there were these gems in there and we make them visible. Like, I don't think Pythagoras theorem is a human invention. It was always there. Now, the creativity that you need uh, for math um, can be wholly contained within the thinking within math, okay? Uh, but if you ever want someone to be able to explain how the ideas occur to them. I mean, many artists cannot explain how they think. And many mathematicians cannot, help, cannot tell you how they think. But we will all be enriched as a whole if you have people who can somehow expand their thinking spaces to incorporate neighboring domains. Uh, I, I have benefited so much by trying to figure out how uh, people in different areas think. But you have to try to, because we tend to equate people with the outcome of what they produce, a writers with a book, a, a plastic artist with sculpture or a painting, a, a mathematician with a theorem, a, I don't know, someone working in, in, in computer engineering with some device. But I think the really interesting thing is to try to understand how was the process that led them to do the things that they did. Uh, so, I don't know if this so oh, that's, that's uh, good. explains this. So you can have creativity and very creative people within a domain without being really a nexus thinker. What the whole point of the book is that if you have some people who have the ability of seeing more than one domain, you can have broader teams. By the way, the concept of nexus thinking applies to teams also, not individuals, okay? You can have a team that functions as a whole, but in order as a function as a whole, you need enough connectivity there. And sometimes having people who have disability uh, is essential. I mean, for example, a, a classical example 
uh, going back, this may resonate with people in technology, Bunny Barbush, who was the legendary dean of MIT, who basically, um, without him, we wouldn't have radar, and without radar, we wouldn't have won the World War II. He saw someone who could understand two domains equally well. Uh, so the idea of bridging domains is the whole point of the, of the book. Uh, speaking of the book, I have a question here from Philip Iacconi. Um, what is the significance of the cover illustration on your book? And I think it's that interference pattern in black and gray. Uh, and it's, um, if I have had more time, <coughs> this is a, a, a sculpture. It's actually like a relief of, yeah, three waves produced by an Italian artist. Um, if I have had more time, I would have done some experiment in lab with three pipettes, uh, the blue representing the coolness of science, the red representing the, the fighting energy of art, and maybe a purple representing technology. But we were in a lockdown, so we had to look for an appropriate image. And this is the one that caught our attention. Was uh, in an exhibit uh, organized by Louis Vuitton, but is um, the name of the artist escapes me now, but it's one of an Italian artist. All right, Philip. One, one of the, the things that was uh, really essential in this book was to hire a company that would allow us to get the permits for all the images that went into the book. And for every image, maybe there were two that we contemplated and we didn't put. And maybe they were one or two that we really wanted and we couldn't get the permits for. I see that Larry Henschen has put up a, a statement to everybody um, and it's in the chat. You can read it. Um, appreciate it. Did anybody else have a question that went in there? We have five minutes. I could end up leading, reading Larry's. I think it's very good. Well, why don't you read it? Yes. Uh, sure. The idea of trying to understand how a mathematician thinks and how a concept was discovered is something that we should teach in our classes. My math classes consisted of presentations of the most elegant proofs of various theorems, but I was never taught how those concepts were, I'm scrolling, uh, discovered. Yeah. Do you have a plan? So this is a question to you. Do you have a plan for using your ideas to change the way teachers teach? Yeah, I think that if you know something about history, and this applies to math, uh, you, I think it's really good. So for example, yeah, I mentioned lots of things in math. Um, there are people like Riemann that he uses sketches, but then in math, what happens is, as opposed to art, in art, I mentioned Guernica and 43 sketches, okay? And basically the mission of every curator of an exhibit is to show the evolution of something. In, in math, all the scaffold that get to produce a final proof is removed. So it looks magical. It looks like standing there in midair, perfect, glowing, but you have no idea how it came into being. So there are only a few people in math that have been able to explain what they do for the masses. Hadamard is one, Poincaré is another one. John Conway was another one. But, uh, but the same thing applies to, to lots of parts of physics. And uh, knowing how something came into being and knowing how ideas went kind of nowhere, but they were so nicely organized. I think it's something that we should do more in the way that we teach to students. Julio, this has been great. Uh, I appreciate all of the things you've brought to our attention. 
Um, I have the book already. I have not read it. I have other things I've got to read between now and New Year's. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate all of these ideas, and I hope they have been stimulating for those of us in the Ameritai organization. And, and this, is, this is the best audience. Uh, I, I, I have a whole bunch of our colleagues in the acknowledgement of the book, uh, ranging from Joel Mokir to a whole bunch of people, okay? But, um, but uh, I see this book as the beginning of something, not at the end of something. Because when we are trying to publish the book, they, let's state the fact that 95% of the books is prose. Okay, uh, people ask you, send me a chapter. Well, that doesn't work here. And the second question was, okay, so tell me what book is similar to this one. And I couldn't come up with anything. So, so you have these two extremes, bulk of books being text, the design of the book not really being super important. And then you have Tashen, and Phaidon and publishers that are mostly images. Right. And there's not much in between. And we wanted text and images to, we want someone in, in, in a comment of the book said that the book is autological in the sense that when you have it in your hands, it kind of embodies the concept that is trying to convey itself. And I, I like that comment. But it, it has been great on this. And I want to thank Elmer, who had the idea about doing this. And Elmer, if you are there, I thought more about music and how music could connect with some of these things. Okay. And I will thank Amy and Gina. Uh, our associate and so we've been having had a great day and uh, I think we can end the session uh, thanks to everybody for joining and um, I suppose the last thing Julio if I can say it is you everybody should buy this book <laughs> okay Shame bye. To advertise it. bye Steve bye 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 everybody <laughs>